life that would give him the feeling of being worthwhile. <laughs> Today on Between Two Amps, you're not going to believe this, we have another very special guest with us. You might know him from such punk bands as Paint It Black, uh, Mariachi El Bronx, uh, Boy Sets Fire. Hope Conspiracy. I've heard of them. Yeah. I've heard of them. Um, And Paint It Black. This guy that he, he just went by Seal. I, I think is Seal. is what he went by. It's crazy. Today we've got Jared Shabelson on the show. Give a warm between two amps welcome. <sighs> <laughs> so Jared, thank you so much hey. for for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks guys for having me. It's awesome. This is cool what you guys started doing. Oh, we we also forgot to mention one big thing is uh, the beat off. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is beat off, which is Jared's podcast with Ben Kohler ben from Kohler. Converge, yeah. So another yeah. one of our buds. Um, and they had what? What? First of all, what's that podcast about? Um, it's just two drummers who have been friends for you know almost yeah. twenty years. Yeah. Um, we sometimes play drums and we sometimes just just talk and like it started out as like a motivational thing to help each other uh, during COVID to stay focused on like practicing and mm-hmm. and not like getting super depressed and then we started talking to friends and then we were figured out how to micro all of our stuff up and then we figured out that we could have mics and then we figured out how to play along to music and then we figured out that we could just do it all at once and then we could video so it was just us like learning technology as we went along <laughs> and just being and just being idiots and then just playing drums for a couple hours and then just videoing it nice. you know nice. um and it turned into a a, a, a fun thing that helps both of us kind of get through you know not touring and not working <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah so it's called the beat off um nice. and it's about drums twisted minds love that yeah <laughs> and it's just two guys it's just two guys just just beating two drums guys beating off <laughs> nice well we started yesterday we made a post um i saw that <laughs> yeah we took a break from beating off to go uh play some tennis and, and have a whack off, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh man. Tennis punks. I love that. Yeah. Tennis, tennis punks. punks. It's a real thing. So Jared, like when you, what, what, what sparked your interest in music? Was it, did you get into music first and then you know, like find punk and start to play drums or, uh was it some other instrument was it like playing music first and then like you got into punk like how how did your journey begin like getting so into I, to music so when i was really young um i was in i was in second grade and uh and i was trying everything you know like i was really interested in like um you know my friends were all like getting into skating and i was like all right cool i'm gonna get into skating and, and it was fun you know we're young we're like i said second grade we're not mm-hmm not really doing it we're just learning how to like Mm -hmm. do things together but um then everyone started playing hockey and i was like that's just not interesting to me and um my dad was really big into listening to uh to records and he was super into uh big into like 70s rock the stuff that he grew up on you know so a lot of led zeppelin janis joplin Jimi hendrix you know cream all those the bigger artists you know Mm -hmm. from from the time and i just i kept hearing led zeppelin and being like this is this is it this is this is life, you know? And so I wanted to do that, but, um, it, I didn't really know what it was that I liked about it, you know? So I remember asking my parents, like, I think, I I think, I think drums, I think that's the thing, you know, like, I, I think I want to stop doing all this other stuff and and I want to learn how to play drums. So, um, they made me get a practice pad and drumsticks and take lessons for a year to prove Mm. to them that it was worth buying a drum set, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I got an IOU. I did that for a year, got an IOU for like my birthday that said something like, you know, a drum set, you know? Mm-hmm. So we went and bought this, um, it was called Blackhawk and it was made by Gretsch. 
Okay. And it was um, a five piece Black Hawk kit. And uh, I had that thing for years and, and until I think I had that until from like third or fourth grade until high school. So it was a full size kit. It was a full size kit, a beginner kit, you know? Yeah. And so would you like Pearl Export kind of on that same level? Or for, no? no, because my step up was my Pearl Export. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So then I got a Pearl right. Export and I was like, this is it. I got that because <laughs> my, my, my punk band was starting to, to, to play shows. And I was like, I can't play on my Blackhawk. I need a Pearl, you know? Mm -hmm. um, nice. So we bought a Pearl Export and that was probably, that might have been like, freshman year of high school mm -hmm. you know maybe maybe freshman year of high school yeah that was my yeah that was definitely freshman year of high school because i was in a punk band there then called um what were we called we were called haywire oh that's yeah, a good we were, yeah haywire we we're so, pretty awful <laughs> of course as you should be yeah we were, we were um, terrible i think we covered like disconnected by face to face and a lot of like no effect songs and uh, you know well, so so where where was this? Where 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 did you grow up originally? In Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Nice. Yeah. I know Cherry Hill. Yeah. Do you? I, yeah, well, I I I work near there. Um I, I'm blanking on the town. Um King of Prussia. But yeah, I was I was I was there for a number of years. And then I had uh family in Haddonfield, New Jersey. So Haddonfield um, is right next next door. Yeah neighboring neighboring city yeah. or town yeah so but it was a so great I'd... place to grow up because you're 10 minutes away from center city you know philadelphia yeah. 15 minutes maybe so <laughs> so did you start like for that band you got the pro export you got haywire mm. you guys started playing shit did you guys have a demo or anything or did you guys just start like playing like local no. shows or did you guys already play in like in the city so be so before that you know i um you're like if you're talking about like middle school era i was I was playing in like jazz band mm -hmm. and, you know, and so I was already getting into like, um, I didn't really know at that point, I didn't really know about punk yet, you know, mm -hmm. like, so, so I, uh, middle school, I was really into white zombie, nine inch nails and jazz band. And like, you know, and, and a lot of like, a lot of like, like notorious BIG and like, mm -hmm. you know, old dirty bastard and Wu Tang, all that stuff was mm -hmm. like, like that's I, I i know they don't make sense but they did make sense in the 90s it didn't oh, totally. matter you know yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um and then i got into high school and um and the the singer for that band haywire mike guessman he he had an older sister and um and they had this group of friends that that were really into punk and do you guys know well he lives out here a friend of ours a friend of mine his name is scott eastwood and okay. he He's, he's awesome. Great dude. But he was my sister's age. And so they were all really into punk and I didn't know anything about it, but they brought me to the truck to go see Lifetime and Weston. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was Lifetime, Weston, Doc Hopper and Brody. And this was in 1996. I saw so that my tour freshman. actually, not Doc. It was Lifetime and Weston came through town. Yeah. So Doc Hopper, Brody were probably the opening, lo okay. the, the locals, right? Uh -huh. Um, so 96 that was my first show so that got me into punk then i was like oh this is this is gonna happen like this is really cool like led zeppelin was great and jazz is really great and i still listened to it and played i went to school for jazz i did all that but mm -hmm. but this was like i felt like i had a home i understood like everyone got me and it was all because these older kids took me to see these mm -hmm. things and so we started doing that band haywire just like covering all those band songs um lifetime songs and whatever i'm going to see as many of these like what I at the time I would still consider those underground bands, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if they are now, but but then, um, then I started my then I got into like Straight Edge and all that stuff, and, mm -hmm. and then that bands those those bands started. Those playing. bands, those bands started. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Haywire didn't last very long, but Straight Edge, <laughs> Straight Edge came in, and, and then was it X Haywire X after that, or no? Then Haywire <laughs> broke up. And me and Mike Guessman, uh, the same guy, mm -hmm. we started a band with my my best friend Eric Snyder, mm -hmm. um, a guy Paul Kiernan. And um, do you know Todd DePopolo? Do you guys know Todd? He mm -hmm. he. You know Rick Barnhart? Uh, I, uh, like Ferret. I remember. Records? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know him, but I remember. Okay. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Rick and Todd were like these older kids that were like really into hardcore, and we're like, whoa, 
they're like these older kids that have tattoos and stuff. It was super cool. <laughs> and he started singing for our band. And that was X Trading Places X. Ooh. Love uh, the movie. Trading Places. X yeah, the movie. Trading and Places in Philly. X. X in Philly, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Trading Places. But X, you know, we're straight edge. Yeah, yeah. Hey, man, I, I get it. I, I <laughs> great. What'd you guys sound like? I never played you the demo. <laughs> no, now I'm really intrigued. Oh my god, I want to hear this. Uh, it's it's um, it was like Youth Crew, like fast songs that you only sing about Straight Edge and like you know, um. So it was like kind of like Youth Crew, but if I remember correctly, I think I played bongos on one song. <laughs> what? Yes, you did. <laughs> I totally I, did. I, I have to hear this. So, so <laughs> okay, you played bongos. How did you? Okay, how did you learn how to play? I guess where did you learn how to play the like the typical like I used to call it like the no effects beat, you know, like the mm -hmm. fast punk beat, you know. For me, it wasn't no effects; it was screeching weasel. But then later on, when I was describing it, I'd be like, oh, it's like the no effects Fat Records drum beat, you know. So for me, screeching weasel came after. Like I, no effects was first. Okay. Before no effects was before screeching weasel, but. The band that I got into very, like the, the, the first, actually, I don't know. It's either Lifetime or, or Sick of It All. I'm not sure which okay. one came first. They were very close. Um, Sick of It All, uh, Blood, Sweat, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, or Blood, Sweat, and No Tears? Yeah, but, yeah. Blood, Sweat, and Tears? What's it called? Mm -hmm. I Blood, think there was a comp. There was a comp called Blood, Sweat, and No Tears. And the album was called Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Good, Should we do good a quick question. I don't know. Duke, I want to do a little quick... Uh... Are, are we are we googling let's do a yeah. google on that one because yeah i can't remember which but anyway so it was lifetime and sick of it all both came around the same time and they actually have a lot of that same what you're calling the fat records beat like that's yeah. still existing in those yeah yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah but then when i heard no effects do it i was like whoa this is like like this is perfect you know like he's he's so perfect like the way he plays that is so perfect it's unbelievable. So, so it is blood, sweat, and no tears. It's no tears. Isn't there isn't there a comp called Blood, Sweat, and Tears then? I don't know about the comp, but I know it says Blood, Sweat, and No Tears is a sick of all record. So I had that. Somebody brought me that cassette for my birthday yeah, when I was that's like. That's a fucking great record, man. That, I was yeah. like one of the first in, you know, when I was in high school, too. Doesn't that have um, clobbering time on it? Yeah. Yeah. But that's the one where it's like his drumming is so thunderous i was just like holy shit man yeah it's really yeah. powerful and he's playing fast but he's it sounds so fucking just like monstrous on that record yeah so it's kind of the same beat but then when you heard it applied to a pop punk song mm -hmm. then you know it kind of separated um yeah yeah like the 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 kick drum was like what you're saying the no effects beat yeah, yeah. or the fat records beat you know that yeah, yeah. that was really just like the recording you know oh, it's okay, the same yeah. it's the same beat you mm -hmm. know but yeah, so that it, it was some some one of those bands. Mm -hmm. But yeah, then Trading Places is really uh, really took off until yes. until I did the unthinkable. I What's sold that? out. Uh, sold out. Sold out early. I sold oh, out. Oh no! Was I'm it on sorry. your twenty first birthday? No, it was long before that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I held out until my twenty first birthday. 21st when did you <laughs> when did you start when did you start your journey in in the straight edge uh it, i was 15 somewhere in there i think like it was like it was like su super angry straight edge kid and yeah. like you know like try you know yeah. trying to figure out life and being angry about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, I'll tell you what, it got me through a lot of hard times and I'm glad that I found it. It definitely introduced me to my entire life from now and from then till even now. Mm -hmm. But that part of it wasn't wasn't the important part for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fine. So I, so I, I got to leave, so, guys. Got to leave, sorry. <laughs> so after you <laughs> kind of made the switch to to straight edge bands like what were the like what were the big influences there like were there any drummers that like really stood out to you as as guys that you were really stoked on well armand was was the, like always yeah. the untouchable to me you know from sick of it all he was just mm -hmm. he's so powerful and he was just 
and even seeing them because they played a lot, you know, in Philly. And yeah. And it was just, he was just so perfect. And it just like, I just felt like I'd never heard any mistakes. I never, I just felt like the energy and like the raw power of his drumming. And I just thought he was, he was just next level. But then, you know, Earth Crisis and like Snapcase and, you know, the, the California Takeover, like all, you mm-hmm. know, those things started happening. And then listening to bands like Strife, like, you know, Strife had some of the most incredible drumming and they've always had some of the best drummers in art. <laughs> yeah, true always mm-hmm. you know and like um same with with, with um snapcase and mm-hmm. uh and then i heard 108 and i was like okay this is it's something else <laughs> yeah i heard i heard threefold misery and i was like that I, album I, is I, insane still like, it's yeah. like it's because I, I put together like Naraj and i were talking about high school playlists i made a high um, school playlist and it's like seven <laughs> hours that i'm gonna post on our cha- on our YouTube channel, it's I ridiculous. can't wait to listen to it. It's just from high school though. All my band, all the bands I listened to in high school. Yeah, I love it. But it so th- when when I did mine, it was like definitely like the hardcore of the late '90s that I really got into, and like some of the stuff like didn't quite hold up. Like there's definitely the nostalgia oh, yeah. element there. Yeah, yeah. But that threefold misery, that entire album, like it's great like the recording's great the drum sounds are amazing the playing is amazing like it's Vic's guitar playing yeah, is, who's the guy who played drum on that who, who's the because then they who's playing drums on that record i honestly i i, I don't know I, I think at that time i was i never um i never paid attention to personnel like i never paid attention to who was in what band, what band? Yeah, yeah. i i really would only would I, if i had the album I would just read who they thanked and then go buy those records. But I never even thought about reading who was in the band. Got it. it. I I think on that album, it was um, was was Chris. I can't remember his last day. He played in Texas is the Reason and Just to Brazil. He was in uh, Songs of Separation. He recorded that record. The drummer for uh, on the Threefold Misery is, I think, this guy named Matt Cross, who's like a session guy. And I think he played in a bunch of, I think he might have played in New York bands and he came in and I guess he tracked that record in one take. That's the lore. Um, what? <laughs> uh, Amazing. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, but, um, yeah, that I'm looking awesome. it up, by the way. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, what we about, got, we, we need fact. You also had a pretty awesome drummer in Philly that was Wagon Shoots. I mean, well, like I said, I got, Lifetime was one of the first bands I got into, you know, and mm. so Wagon Shoots was one of these um, incredibly uh, influential drummers in in maybe regionally. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's further than regionally, but his his way of playing created an entire Philadelphia sound, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of drumming. Yeah, um, yeah. And and of course, you know, like like I would sneak out of my house to go see Ink and Dagger play at the Stalag, you know. So yeah, like yeah. so, you know, that was early days and even when he was playing with them and then Mm -hmm. terry was starting you know but like it was it was just one of those um i think we're lucky to grow up in that era in that region to get to see bands like like to get or wags playing or to get to see dead guy or you know to see things like like that happening that were bands really pushing the limits of of not just um punk playing the fat records beat yeah 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 you know so another one, another huge one would be Alan Cage. And in fact, there was one time we were playing, Boyce It's Fire was playing a festival with Quicksand mm-hmm. not that long ago. I mean, now it's, yeah, it's been a little bit, but yeah. Um, and I acknowledge the fact, and I told him, I'm sorry, I'm going to punish you right now. It has to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but but you you changed my life because he was the first person that I ever heard bring this john bonham type feel into punk yeah. you know and he like he i don't know of anyone that was doing that before in that no. kind of genre and yeah no. so i think he was a huge influence on me mm-hmm. he yeah, also like has a the, groove that just like yeah yeah it is the, the, is the grooves like the production especially like the the don fury like the first because i think he did the the ep first seven, and yeah. The uh, the first full length, possibly the I, I don't know if he did. Um, I don't think Don Fury did the, the I don't think Don Fury did the slip. 
if he did that thing that's pretty insane yeah like but that yeah is so great still like quicksand's definitely one of the bands that like has that early stuff holds up like i'll still sit down and play through those like if i just want to mess around and you know like just kind of fuck around with playing something you know and not really think about like creating a part or learning yeah. a part i'll i'll play quicksand songs and, and just go through an entire album and just be like my god this is still so good you know it's still like, so good i never was oh i did play drums when i was younger like in i tried to but i always wanted to be a drummer so every time i listened to music i not only listened to like you know pick it apart guitar wise but you're like i pay attention to drumming a lot because a good drummer makes a band fucking awesome a bad drummer can make a band awful it you can know? So, so, you yeah. know, so it's like i always paid attention to to like drumming because it's like it's such an if you have a good drummer there's a lot where you can take a band musically in my opinion you know there's also the this i agree 100 percent. but there's this beautiful thing that happens sometimes with a bad drummer that no, works yeah. and when it works it's you don't even realize that the drummer is is bad and like out of time and dropping sticks and yeah, yeah, you know yeah. it doesn't matter because the band learns like they've all learned together. I agree. And so yeah. they you know and that's it's really cool when that happens too mm -hmm. and it, they, that happens more often than than I think we yeah. we recognize. No, you're right. You're right. Because when I I should actually take that back because definitely my first bands, you know, the drummer wasn't the great. Oh, you know, wasn't like greatest, but I learned how to play together right like i was yeah. a good guitar player you know and we all started and it was like you know i learned how to play you know and grow with that with that musician with his instrument right and mm -hmm. there are times where it's like oh you might get these people with different abilities and yeah you're right uh the drummer or someone might not be as good and you're like oh wait but they fucking pull it off and it sounds yeah great you know whatever they do yeah you know? it, it's really cool when that happens uh, by the way, you were right. It is Matt Cross that played on that. Okay. All right. That nice. record is unbelievable, you know? So to, to go back to that, yeah, I I started finding all these bands that were like, you know, in this hardcore, straight as hardcore world that yeah. gave me a place that I felt like was home. So I wanted to start learning that because they accepted me and I was going to school, getting beat up by the jocks and stuff. Like people liked me, you know, but like I was little. Mm -hmm. I had colored hair. I wore big baggy pants and a headband and bleached tips on my hair, you know, yeah. <laughs> and like tips, I had... frosted tips. So they weren't frosted. They were just grown out. <laughs> <You're right>? <laughs> 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 but like, you know, I was little, I would get beat up a lot. And like this, I, that didn't happen in this other world. Or if it did, mm -hmm. then I had people that would go find or help yeah. me. We yeah. would take care of the situation like you know a, as yeah. we needed to and i wasn't big yeah. enough to do it on my own so we went in numbers you know and yeah. i thought and so I, I i just kept learning how to play you know bands that i really liked then and had my pearl export kit and like um i had this ride symbol that i it was the first symbol i ever got mm -hmm. and i it's in this room somewhere really it's got it i know it is because i never got rid of it i just don't know where uh -huh. <laughs> I just have no. So it was a Sabian <clears throat> hand hammered ride that um, I got at a used like a pawn shop or something. And it, um, do you know that uh, you're neither of you are, are drummers, but do you know what the keyhole, what keyholing is like on a, no. on a symbol? Mm -mm. So, like, it's when you have a symbol on a stand that doesn't have um, any plastic. So it's just metal on metal on the okay. stand for yeah. too long and it's vibrating and it works its way it, it cuts the hole in the middle into like another part and makes it like a keyhole you know uh, uh, okay okay oh wow so it had this gnarly keyhole through the whole thing so th it would never sit flat it would always sit on an angle no matter what mm -hmm. but it would always sit at this exact same angle um because that's how i bought it so i just had to learn how to play it on. but that symbol sounded great and i used it on i used that on uh, before I met Naraj, right before I met Naraj, I was in a band on Creep Records called Man Without Plan. And we we were recording with General George Fullen from Clockwise. And I remember um, I used that. I still had that symbol. That was the last time I recorded with it. But when I joined Hope Conspiracy, that was I still had that symbol with me um, up until um, I can't remember why. Oh, it was just too jazzy because I was out of jazz school. You know, was it a, was it a crash ride or, or a regular ride? 
it was just a, a, a 22 inch, just uh, a medium yeah. ride, but it, okay. but it was super washy, but it wasn't like, it didn't have like volume. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't get over even like Jonas's bass tone. It was just yeah, yeah. louder than, than, than my drums, you know, <laughs> yeah. still Jonas's bass tone is just, it, it's, yeah. it's so loud. It's, I love it. It's like, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's his sound, but I had to start changing my cymbals just to kind of get over the, the, the tones that we were playing, mm -hmm. you know, the guitars and so, the bass. So were you still playing the export at that at that point, or was it no. Blackhawk still? So Blackhawk, I don't know. I think I gave Black. Oh, I gave Blackhawk. This is funny. So I gave Blackhawk to a family friend, um, and his older brother and I were still well, well, the family. We're all still really mm -hmm. tight. But his older brother is a band manager out here, and so we oh. still talk all the time. Um, and they had the kitten, and, and that was he. They lived in D.C. So he got the Blackhawk, the export I brought to college, but I had um, for, for high school, when I graduated high school with the money that I got for like graduation money, mm -hmm. I bought a Pearl Masters kit, but it was a 20, Ooh. a 20 inch kick. It was a Pearl Masters mahogany. So it was like four ply African mahogany, but it was a 20 inch kick and it was a nineties style, like square toms, a 10 by 10, 12 by 12, 14 by 14. Oh, okay. The little fusion kit, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think I had a piccolo. <laughs> no, you did. Really? Yes. I think I did. I yes. think I did. I think I had a pearl free floating brass piccolo. Pearl I wonder where that is. Brass piccolo. That's got, I never sold that. That must, so I've got to find that. Did you play that? Like what? In... Go ahead. I... Like what influenced? Like where did the piccolo come from? Like how Snapcase. did that happen? The it, first band like, I heard, first band I heard play piccolo was Snapcase on Looking Glass Self, and I was like, Snap "What case. is? Yeah, what is that drum?" And then I'd seen live. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah it's like this. <laughs> yeah, thing, and I was like, "Ooh, yeah." Um, the 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 piccolo was a huge thing then, but you know, it also at the time I was really getting into jazz and fusion and and stuff, and so um, I also noticed that like those players were using him too. Dave Weckl had his own signature snare that was only like a maybe a five or four and a half or something deep. So like not quite piccolo, but a little bit bigger, but yeah. it was a style then that all, all genres were using. So I, I think I had a, thir a 13 inch piccolo that was like the snare I used. And, and then when I went to college, um, I went to SUNY purchase studying jazz performance and I took, I must have taken that with me, but then I got the the Dave Weckl signature snare, which had two throw offs on it, so you oh, could really? like, so you could like turn the snares off, or you could turn them like really off. I don't know. Like, I never, <laughs> like you had like so you could play the bongo parts, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, the bongo solo was sick. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> was so uh, that was like a jazz snare, I'm assuming. Right, because I don't I know. Didn't, Dave. I didn't really know the difference then. You uh -huh. know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't understand. I didn't understand the difference. I, I think that to me, like playing drums was just playing drums, right? So if I was playing yeah. in my my straight edge band, or right. my hardcore band, training places, or I was playing in, in jazz band, I played them. I played exactly the same. Yeah, you know, yeah. like the same energy. I did. I never. Yeah. I I never learned that like you had to like make them different. Cause it was the same to me. Mm -hmm. Like. You know, I felt like when I was playing in jazz band, I was made fun of for playing in jazz. When I was been when I was playing in my punk and hardcore band, I was made fun of for being into punk and hardcore. Like they yeah. were both the exact same thing. You know, yeah. you know, I was picked on by all groups of people for whichever one I was doing. So it didn't, I couldn't separate the two. Yeah, you know? jazz and punk is quite the uh, quite the opposite in a way. I, I don't. I completely disagree. Really? Yeah. No. Like okay. it's so funny. Like. Yeah. I mean, I not remember... not the cultural aesthetic around it. I think cultural aesthetic around it is all is still like you know we're doing something different. We're definitely you know pushing the status quo. But from a musician standpoint, maybe I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't I, know. I, I feel like because like kind of going back to like you know punk isn't a sound kind of. Oh, that's true. Thing. It's yeah. it's like a community, and it's kind of mm -hmm. like you know looking at jazz artists are definitely as much on the fringe and yeah. like. Uh, you know, every you know work. Everybody works together to you know. It's like as incestuous as like punk bands and like yeah. 
same guys going around and just like you know it's like oh he's doing a group with this you know, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. just like um but like i remember because my my dad listened to a lot of uh smooth jazz which wasn't the best but um is that like there were some Michael, like bright okay. spots in there there was some like miles davis and um but like one of the one of the things that I'm super grateful for is like getting exposed to like Steely Dan. Like I love Steely Dan and of course, incredible. And it was so like early on, I remember on like an early darkest hour tour, we stopped by some record store and, uh, they had can't buy a thrill on, on, on tape. And I was just like, Oh, it was used. I was like, great. It's a buck. Like I put it in the tape player and everybody was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, at my, uh, at John Henry, singer from Darkest Hour, like, uh, two years ago, out of the blue, at, like, we were hanging out, he was just like, dude, I don't know if you remember this, but, like, I threatened to throw your Steely Dan tape out of the van. <laughs> He's like, man, I was so wrong. They're amazing. <laughs> it's true man everyone will come around at some point you know that's funny i agree i agree with fred on this like it, it's a movement right punk is a is a, a movement there is a there's an attitude more than a sound yeah yeah right but but you can hear it right away and be like oh this is a punk band yeah, yeah right yeah. and it doesn't necessarily have to be super fast angry screaming yeah yeah exactly you know yeah yeah um but the thing that like when I was studying jazz, it was like, you know, it was just people who who just loved music and we just wanted to create. And no matter what it was, we would create it. You know, when I was yeah. in when I was in school studying jazz, um, I was doing that punk band on Creep Records called Man Without Plan. And then um, I Am The Resurrection was happening. And, you know, like I was I was playing with them uh, when when their drummer couldn't do it. And mm -hmm. we were doing a lot of stuff with like page 99 and orchid yeah. and yeah. you know like and but we were all studying music or production or art you know yeah, yeah, um yeah. and it all it, it all has a place with each other i mean you know this about me naraj like i like everything yeah right yeah and this is a yeah. thing that i get made fun of quite often like don't ask jared his opinion he's gonna find something that he could say he likes about this <laughs> band right because there's <laughs> which is rad there's yeah. no reason there's nothing in my mind that can make me say like this is terrible because like it's still someone created it out of nothing it's uh, still have you seen the new red hot chili peppers fucking <laughs> video <laughs> so... i haven't i haven't i mean I haven't. and here's my take maybe this will be what changes my mind well, but here's my say, take but... again red hot chili peppers is one of my least favorite bands of all time right however individually as musicians they're great except for vocals <laughs> I mean, he he he's a good, great singer. He he just it, raps. Yeah, when he sings, he's gr he he has a great voice too. Don't get me wrong, but when he does Look, the Fred Flintstone, it's like come I'm on, converting man. you. I'm converting you. You just in a roundabout way said you like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I did not. I did not. <laughs> for the record, I, did not. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I'd love Naraj. Here, wait. I'm uh, gonna tweet this real quick. Yeah, uh, uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Individually, then, like, you like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, I like individually. I will say that they are exceptional musicians. Say individually, I like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just can't come out. I, I just can't do it. <laughs> but I, like I, I, I appreciate that attitude, and like I, as I've gotten older, and you know, have been around a lot more musicians, especially in bands that may or may not have resonated with me like everybody's out there creating and you know even like the red yeah. hot chili peppers like yeah. it doesn't resonate with me uh, yeah. for most of it but it's made a lot of people really stoked yeah and like mm -hmm. like my default is always like I, you know like i used to get great joy out of like knocking other people's like music down and like mm. And even if it's not like, I, I just feel like, I don't know if it's just with social media and everybody having an a opinion on everything and just being overwhelmed with so much negativity and like, like just in all of the comments section of the internet. <laughs> like, I mean, 
now I'm like, ah, oh, like why? Wh- I don't, I don't know that I enjoy like making fun of stuff. Is like I still do sometimes, but like, sure. but sure. like I, I really want to t- work to be better at that. Like, you know, it's like I don't have to comment on it. It's like I mean, if I'll tell you I, one thing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Playing with like Jared and you know other people, it's like. I have definitely, and as I've obviously grown older too, but you, I listen to music in a different way. And I, ever since I started playing in bands and really like playing in bands and like recording, it's hard for me to listen to music without dissecting it, right? I had this conversation with somebody the other day and I forgot who it was. It's really hard for me to listen to music just as an objective listener and just be like, oh, cool, this is great piece of art. I'm always dissecting it, right? But then as I started, the, the only one of the positive upsides to it is I can see the musicianship in other music that i would not have been into or i'm like oh that's not my thing but holy shit that drummer is incredible or you know Mm -hmm. that snare sound or that like what he's doing here on guitar you know it's like i can appreciate that you know and then that'll kind of give me more appreciation for that genre or for that band you know yeah i I just think in general like people creating something as a as a group is Mm -hmm. very challenging and the fact that people are able to get a final product on it is very impressive to me you know, I didn't come up with it. It's their creation. That's what they were happiest with. That's what they want to put out in the world. That's their art. That's great. I love it. You know, I think mm-hmm. it's I think it's an incredible thing that that I wish I was more accepting when I was younger. Yeah, yeah um, I agree. I, yeah. I, I, I was I was angry and I felt like I was mm-hmm. bullied a lot and I didn't want to accept anyone else's opinion, you know, mm-hmm. except for the people that I already respected. So you could show me something new back then and, you know. I I wasn't gonna like it. I I'll, wasn't gonna allow myself to like yeah. Oasis. And, and, and what? I and I I wasn't. I wasn't going oh, I, to. I a hundred percent because it was new. That. You know, I mean, and I love. They're one of my favorite bands, and they're one of the best bands that have ever walked this planet. And I just, and I knew it then, but I couldn't admit it. I just, you know, because it was new. That's how I was with Nirvana. Because they came, I was like, fuck that, man. Some jock ass bullshit, you know? And I had just gone to yeah. a Slapshot show. So I was like, fucking nonsense, you know? And I was like, yeah, I just <laughs> went to Slapshot, you know? And uh, yeah, it was never mind. That record came out and everyone it was like the fucking biggest thing, you know, in the world. It just changed music. And I was like, ah, fuck these, this band, you know, fake punks or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just a fucking, you know, angry like kid who just wanted, you know, to be different so badly. And then when, you know, Nirvana came out um, with, never mind, all these, you know, jocks in my school would be like, yeah, man, this is sick. And I was just like, what? Fuck this. You know, because then like all these other. Uh, it's the, the fan base you hated more than it was the band. It was because in secret, all my friends who were also punks were listening to that record. Yeah. <laughs> but no one would tell each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, but let's, let's, let's. It's, before we take this too far, let's put it into perspective because we're talking about a time period where there was no internet, there was yeah. no Spotify, there was no streaming. To find something, you had to go out and listen to it, hear it on the record, or find it in a record store, which was really challenging to find underground music in a record store. You had to, you, you weren't able to order it from BMI or whatever the uh, the catalogs were yeah, that yeah. you know you had to find your underground record store that was carrying it, which was harder to find back then as well too. So yeah. it was easier to be jaded. Because you had to put a lot of work into getting yeah. to hear that, you I know. See that. Yeah, yeah. You know, now you can just be like, well, "Let's see what this is. This is garbage," or you yeah, know, like, yeah, I'll get, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter. There's not as much. Um, there's not as much emotion that arises from arises from it because you're also not going through the whole process of like opening it up, you know, taking the taking your knife and rubbing it along the side of the CD if it's yeah, a yeah. CD, or taking your knife and putting it inside the vinyl to cut open the vinyl, yeah, and yeah. that smell that comes out of mm-hmm. each one, pulling out the liner notes, putting it in for the first time, and listening to the whole thing complete as one solid piece of art that was supposed that it was, you know the way it was. You're listening yeah. to singles now, yeah, you know, yeah, and you yeah. can instantly say, nah, "I don't like this." After 30 seconds, and you're already you've already given up because it's, there's no there's nothing there's no commitment to listening to music now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Which sucks. Which sucks. Mm-hmm. I mean, it has affected me in the sense of like where I don't listen to a full record. It's hard for me to listen to just a full record start to finish. When I had a cassette, you put it in, 
it's playing all the way through and then it flips and then you got the yes. other side. <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll talk to you after I listen to this album. It wasn't, mm. you know, like, I'm yeah. going to go do this right now. We'll, we'll talk when it's done. Yeah, 35 yeah. minutes later, you'll be like, have you heard the new fucking 108 record? Yeah, yeah, Holy yeah. shit. Go listen to this, you know? Mm-hmm. I did that with Sam I Am. And, uh, and I remember hearing Clumsy and just be like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. what is this masterpiece, you know? Masterpiece, yeah. Yeah. And now I'm in a band with Sergi and it's, and it's amazing. And like, mm-hmm. he's a close friend of mine and I still look up to him because he was so influential to me in my uh, vulnerable, my most vulnerable years, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. I mean, when you can, yeah. when that happens for sure. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Fred. Oh, so I was gonna, I was gonna ask like, so you went, so you studied jazz. Mm-hmm. And that was that your concentration at, at SUNY? Yeah. So jazz performance. Yeah. Jazz performance. So yeah. And and all the while doing punk and hardcore. Yeah. Like, so what what was your trajectory coming out of there? Like what what was the next yeah. step, the next big thing? So the next step from there was actually pretty interesting. So that's when Man Without Plan was on Creep Records and we were doing we were actually a pretty cool band if you never heard it it was and he's still playing music uh, barkley he's still making man without plan records but we were kind of like the yes of, of of punk we were like <laughs> <laughs> we were like like very like prog like we were crazy time signatures but it all sounded straight you would never notice that we were playing you know going between five and seven and then you know like it, you wouldn't it doesn't sound that way and that's yeah. like that's what yes is listen to mm any listen to roundabout listen to any song you know listen to heart of the sunrise like it's crazy music but you don't recognize it being out of yeah place right yeah so so we were doing that and um we had played a show you probably played this show naraj okay. um so we played we opened up for a show it was man without plan this band called rated r okay which was um Dan Deacon was in that band. Okay. Um, uh, Knives Out, Hope Conspiracy, R- Converge. Really? Were you on that tour? Or were you? No, no Lisi was in the band. Lisi was in the band, I think. No, but yeah. him and I played together for one tour. Ben was playing drums, I think. Oh, then I wasn't. Uh, I've, I've, I didn't play. Ben Kohler? I think so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he might have. He was playing for, for like... Uh, a few shows yeah i wasn't on that tour so we played that and um brandon wallace was there <clears throat> he, he was in knives he, out at the time or no because he was in knives out and i've known okay. brandon just from growing up in the philadelphia area you know and um he told jonas he was like look you gotta like i have a drummer for you like th- this guy can do it you know i've known him for a long time yeah, yeah. he looks like you you know i was just wearing <laughs> what i always wear is like a black or white yeah, t-shirt yeah. and and blue jeans or black jeans like i had like you know the only thing was like i was was kind of like living on a, a couch you know at the school and um you know i think i had like a 40 duct tape to my hand or something and like like a shitty mustache that i didn't know how to shave yet and jonas will always talk about my sh- shoes being like tied so tight because they were so old and the laces were so stretched out that like i was like tripping. so he'll and he was so jo- so Brandon introduced me to to Jonas and Jonas was like there's no way that this fucking degenerate kid is going to play in my band. This is ridiculous. Look at it. But then we it, it happened. So then <laughs> so I I I bought a um a Saab 900 from a yes. family friend and through my drums um and Brandon Wallace and Eric Becker in the in the Saab 900 in the middle of the summer drove up to Boston with my drums and two people in the Saab which, 900. Which, which kit did you have? My Pearl Masters, the 20-inch nice. kit. I had toured with that one. Okay. For, yeah, it was a tiny little kit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I drove up to Boston with them, did the audition, and it worked. But um, I knew all the parts. I could play everything. It was fine. Yeah, but yeah. Jonas Jonas was just a little bummed on how, um, how light I was hitting. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh-huh. And so... He put up um, a sign behind me that said, look cool. There's three rules. Mm-hmm. Look cool, do cool shit. Ah, fuck. Look cool, do cool shit, and don't fuck up or something. It was like, uh-huh. these, are the, these are the three rules, right? That's all I had to do. And, um, and so 
so I so I, I did the audition for the band. It worked out. At that point, I was like a little better. It, 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 yeah, I took care of myself. I learned how to shave and yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. it was like working out and stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, and then we drove down. I was driving back home to, to my parents' house in Jersey. I don't think I was living in Philly at the time. I think I was living in Jersey. And we stopped at Atomic because they were recording EndNote. And Jared, and that's where I met Jared Alexander. Oh, you? Oh, I didn't know that. I th I didn't know it was around that time. I met him while okay. he was at while at Atomic. Okay. While he was recording EndNote, and um, and then um, you guys had already started uh, Suicide File. I, I, I was in Suicide File at the time. I was not in HopeCon when that when that was going on. Right. So then mm -hmm. we started touring together and doing a bunch of shows and exactly. that became like, the, you know, the family. Yeah. And then immediately to, to bring it back to the beginning, the very, um, the very first show we played was at Laga with Sick of It All. Do you remember okay. Laga in Pittsburgh? Club Laga? No. Do you remember that it place? Was, was it upstairs at a place? Oh, oh, yes. I think it was upstairs. And then there was a balcony, but there yes. was like a... It was like a the stage I think had like lights underneath it because yes, it turned yes, into yeah. a club afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I played there. Yeah, there's there was a couple. I'm I'm trying to remember all the clubs in Pittsburgh, but yeah, it did, that sounds familiar. So my very first show with them was with with Sick of It All, and I met Armand at my first show when I felt like I had finally, you know, made it mm -hmm. to like being a musician, uh -huh. even though it's you know it was. Uh, a hardcore band i still felt mm -hmm. like it was the right thing you know yeah, yeah. and um uh, and and he i remember him being like your drums sound really good can you tune mine for me and walked away what <laughs> and i was like whoa yeah of course <laughs> you know oh, shit i'm tuning arvon's drums is so fucking sick Fuck, you know? i need to do that more often uh, like hey your guitar sounds really good can you tune mine for me <laughs> he's not the only one who said that that's happened since it's happened again couple times really weird i, I, I get why. the opposite um dude you gotta fucking tune your guitar dude give me your guitar <laughs> let me tune that for you. yeah i'm the you I'm clearly that guy. don't know how to do i'm that guy <laughs> either way you're getting a free tech <laughs> yeah you've just figured out how to manipulate everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and so so yeah so he was playing a sonar kit then actually and that oh really yeah i wouldn't say that was my introduction to sonar it was a little mm -hmm. bit before that but you, um, if we want, we want to talk about gear. I saw you know who I saw playing a sonar kit uh, early on. The first person I saw was uh, Tim Redman from Tim. Snapcase. Yeah, he played one too. Yeah. So back in the '90s, they were on their way up to become, you know, competitors with DW Pearl yeah. Tama, um, and it worked. It was they are they are incredible drums. It just their their craftsmanship. Um, they they won't. They won't compromise, and so they're incredibly expensive drums. And so it was just, it was just getting harder and harder to, to maintain, I think, keeping them in the States, you know, because they're coming from Germany. Are so, they a German company to begin with? Or? German company. They've been uh, in the same factory since 1800s, I think. Okay. Yeah. Oh. And yeah. they, uh, so those kits, when they were in the, in the 90s, late 90s, were they expensive back then, too? They were expensive, but they were, they weren't as ex well. They, they could have been, yeah. Some of them were. Mm, okay. Like this one that's behind me. This is a mm. this is a 1980 Sonar Phonic, and um, th so I bought this one from my friend Dave Elich, uh -huh. and um, this I had sent the stamp to my my rep at the factory, and he traced the stamp and matched it to this lady that built this kit, and it's. The same lady worked on my, the kit that's in the cases behind me, my my custom kit. She she worked on that kit as well. So it was Whoa. the same person. She worked on both of my crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I love it. So, so you went from, so when you started playing hook on that tour, you had that Pearl um, Masters kit, right? So I had the Pearl Masters kit for um, up until two thousand three. Okay. Um, I stopped using that kit because there was one show we played. Again, I don't remember if you were in the band or not yet. Uh -huh. Again, I don't remember where you, if you had, what time, if you had quit for first, second, third, or fourth time, or what? if you were playing the show. <laughs> Wait, which, which, for which, which band are you talking about? Hope Conspiracy. When you, when you were playing with them? <laughs> which band did so, I quit? Yeah. So there was this one show 
Kevin picked. So I had my toms. They were on a stand. They were okay. on a separate stand. They weren't mounted on the kick. Yeah. And he threw the toms into the crowd. And I was like, <laughs> that's it. That's it. And this kit is no longer on the road. No fucking way. <laughs> and, um, and I got a deal with CNC right then. So oh, CNC yeah, gave, right. built me a kit. And, um, and it was this like black and orange kit. And it was early CNC. Like they, they, they had like, um, you'd only really seen them with like get up kids at that time. Not many oh, people yeah. were playing. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know that many people were playing those things either. Yeah. Cause it was a Kansas city kind of local, you know, custom okay. company. And they built me a kit in 2003 and I used that kit. I'm not joking. I used that kit from 2003 until, um, 2012 maybe really oh. i i just yeah i was never really one all right i'm into gear i can't you can't i have yeah, a lot yeah. of gear okay? i think i think i will say this i think you got more into gear i think when you moved to la i got more into gear when i became more of a professional and it was more readily available for me to get it yeah exactly you know what i mean like mm -hmm. when i had to pay for it full price and i had to source it and find it i i wasn't I didn't have the sources to do that. I didn't yeah, have the yeah. financial ability yeah, yeah, to do totally. that. Yeah. I didn't have a computer of my own, you know, mm -hmm. like I didn't have the way to, to even look mm -hmm. for things. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I got way more into gear when I moved to LA and I got way more into gear when COVID hit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh -huh. um, but I used that kit up until I got, um, I started playing, uh, I, I was touring a lot, right? So I was with, even with Pure Love, I was using CNC still. Oh, yeah. That's and that right. was 2012 to 2014. And then I started playing with Boy Sets Fire. And um, and I started, I used like a couple different companies here and there until I found, um, I tried, you know, other smaller companies. And, you know, and then I, I, I found a home with Sonar. And, uh, and I could bring that back to when I was in high school and my jazz teacher would call me out. I didn't. I didn't go to classes. I didn't have, yeah. like, I didn't go to any, any classes. I just, my jazz teacher or my music teacher would call me out of every class. I, I, I like my, my, it was a, it, high school was great for me because I didn't do high school. Uh -huh. You know, I was at a public school, but I got out of everything. My guidance counselor was like, she hated me. She would like call my parents in and tell me uh, there was one time she said like that I needed to learn this this will only make sense to people in, in certain regions, but I needed to learn how to pump gas because that was the only future I had. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because Jersey? in Jersey and Jersey, yeah. you can't pump your own gas. That's right. Yeah. So so like, it's because I didn't go to classes. I just I, mm -hmm. I would go. I was in everything that had to do with music. Everything. I was at school at six thirty playing with the jazz band, and mm -hmm. then I would play in the freshman wind ensemble all four years of high school. Um, orchestras. I played every theater production. Um, I went to, it's back to sports. I went to every football game, but I was in the marching band, but I didn't miss a single football game all four years of high school. You know, <laughs> like I did everything that had to do with music. Um, and, and I knew I, that's all I was going to do. And so there was one day where I got a phone, uh, a call over the loudspeaker, like asking me to come down to D wing, which was the music wing. And, um, and there was a sonar kit in a box that I, that he like had me put together. Cause I was like, we need a new kit. And I, I, yeah. I, I saw John Riley playing with the Mingus big band in New York when I, and I was like, he was playing a sonar kit and I was like, this is, this is what needs to happen, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And full circle is now I've been a sonar artist since like 2014. Yeah. I think. So, so now that you've been through all of these various kits, like I, I think two part question, like what's the, in, in two directions one like how do you know what to pick out or what do you go for based on the bands or whatever tour you're doing because you know, obviously you've branched out a lot more from from punk into things like uh like with meg or with seal like mm -hmm. how do you pick the gear for each of those gigs and like is there like one piece through all of that, that you're always like, man, I always have to have this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're right. Two part question. So, um, there's, there's definitely a diversity that you can get from specific drums that I can, without getting too nerdy, like I can make 
most things between the drums that I, all the gear that I have here, mm-hmm. I can, I can, I can make something work for almost any genre, but, um, it, a lot of it comes to tuning or heads, head choices. And then it also has to do with like what, um, like the openness of the songs, right? Like if they want things to be really mm-hmm. like bright and, and wide open and, and, or you want things to be like a little bit dead sounding and flat and quick to, you know, quick to get out of the way. Um, and so I, I guess I just hear things and I hear like kind of what range they're in. And like, if they're mixed in a way where they're a little louder or more vibrant, then, then I know I can maybe use like, um, like this 13 inch Tom instead of the 14 inch Tom, or, you know, um, if I'm going to use a, 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 then it's going to be, if I'm using a 13 inch Tom, is it, uh, a nine ply beach with rounded edges, or is it going to be my four ply maple with, you know, two ply re-rings are in it? which is going to be brighter or more diverse and maybe have more sustain. Um, mm-hmm. So, so the, it, it, it also depends on the application, if it's going to be a live show or if we're going into the studio, you know? Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. And I guess, I guess it's kind of hard to explain like briefly, you know, Yeah. <laughs> but it's the same. I think it would be the same for you. Like with, um, uh, with a, a, a pickup, right? Like, you, 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 you like I could look at your guitars and I'll say that's a guitar and you'll look at it and be like yeah but that's a guitar with this pickup and it's gonna sound like this and I'll go oh, well what are you talking about like just play yeah, it yeah. like it's not the right one like, okay you know yeah <laughs> I, like, I don't understand that like I can't show up to HopeCon practice or you know if we we're recording a record with a telly you know you have though I, I have. I've tried. <laughs> you have. Actually, yeah. you can. It, I, I have tried everything, and then Jones is like, dude, what are you doing, man? Get that thing out of here. I've tried right, different is... amps. I've tried different everything, and I just get shut it's down. It's <laughs> noticeable. You're right. It's it is very noticeable. noticeable. Like, it is noticeable. Um, and like when a band's got a sound, it's got a sound. And um, I agree. Well, it's like if you're playing – like I noticed this with Jared when we were, when we were practicing, like um, you know, when we were doing Death Knows Your Name, but even – after that, um, when he was already in LA and started like playing more like you know kind of, like professionally in a sense of like you know playing with as as a um, you know session guy and touring musician, uh, his style would change. So when he'd come back to HopeCon, we'd have to be like, "Yo, you gotta fucking hit those things. You know, you gotta play harder." He's like, "I know, yeah. I'm not used to playing hard anymore, man." <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's different. Yeah. Well, I also think that you know it's we applicable. Time- You're applying it to different scenarios, you know. Totally. But I also like when we were younger, we would, I don't know if it's the same with guitars, like, but with drums, like I, I would hit so fucking hard that it didn't even like, it didn't matter. I could literally be playing a child. I could be playing cardboard boxes and it would sound exactly <laughs> the same. Cause I was just hitting so fucking hard that yeah. the drums would just choke. And it, it, all you're hearing is impact, you know? Yeah. 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 It, di- yeah. it didn't need to be tuned. It didn't matter what heads were on there. As long as they weren't broken, they were working. You know, like (laughs) symbols were just, were like, I just needed the the thickest, the thickest ones that you could have that would, which it's like cycling, which you then find out like, well, the thicker ones are just going to break quicker because they don't, they can't absorb the shock as much, but it, you know, but they were louder. Right. So that's all we cared about is hitting harder. And then I started becoming more and more into like, um, or getting back to where I came from with like, you know, jazz and all that stuff. And, and did I was going beyond the threshold of what the drums were capable of doing, you know? Yeah. And it was just because you were so caught up in the energy, you know? Um, but yeah, so I definitely had to, to dial that back a little bit, but I think we all, and I think death knows your name is a great reference for like showing how we all kind of grew up a little, but we were still fucking angry, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, like we oh, yeah. grew up, you know, we grew up and we got, we, we didn't, we didn't lose, we didn't lose our edge. We just, we just gained control of it, I think. You know? Yeah, it's like um yeah, I think like writing that record in the sense of like, you know, seeing different seeing you as a different musician, or not different music, but seeing you as a musician who's like, you know, really had this control, you know, and then it's like all of us, yeah, we were angry, but we also I think we're all better at our instruments, you know. And it's not, yeah, the, I mean, most, I, it's not the most complex like riffs, but you know, how we put it together and how you approach the whole process is like yeah exactly i mean it doesn't i think we learned that we learned a a lesson on that one which was like that's that other stuff how we how you guys wrote the records before i was involved 
-hmm. it's just not where you are anymore you know yeah. and and we wrote what 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 was the same feeling and the same anger just a modern day version of it yeah and that that that's what that record came out and mm -hmm. so the uh part b is um of your question fred is uh, it's an unfortunate thing that I, I bring with me everywhere that I have to, unless I can get it back line. But I have this artist, Bell Bronze Snare, I'll show you. And it's right here. <laughs> so this. I think it's nice and shiny. I bring this thing with me everywhere. Jeez. And so How much does it that weigh? 30 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like right. a shotgun right well it's it's got a lot of depth and like yeah. um like it's like um it's like you could feel it in your stomach you know like and then it has this crack that just like it, it, it just it's just one of those drums that i've used this drum with um meg myers mm -hmm. i've used this drum with seal i've used this drum with the aquabats oh nice. um I've used this drum with ways away. Um, I've used I use this drum with every single person. I've a voice that's fire. Wow! But that so was that like, thing's been around everywhere, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. This I love this drum, and I have to fly with it sometimes because it's hard to get in certain places, and I just don't want to be without it. You know, yeah. that and then and then my uh, my trusty signature drum key. Ooh, well. Jared Shavelson's <laughs> signature yeah, drum key. The plug, yeah, the plug, the sig key. <laughs> Well, it look, it's on. So I, I modded this snare and made it all gold. So this is goldy, right? And then I have this somewhat matching drum key. So um, who's they just your, look good together. Who's making your drum keys? First off, tell me that doesn't look good together. It looks great. It looks great. Oh, yeah. You're right. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Cosmetically Very fantastic. So um, drumkeyshop.com is who makes them. Nice. Is that where you and can they get have them, some, too? It's where you can get them, too. Yeah. This, so they're, they're awesome um rhino i'm not sure if you know rhino he's toured with like no effects forever and he's just been around he's a dude who's been you if you you'll see him you'll go i've seen that dude i've seen him on stage it, like he's been he's been everywhere i met him okay. when the bronx were out with um with descendants okay uh he was drum teching and, and i think tour manager or production man or stage managing i'm not sure but so he's got a company called drumkeyshop.com and like all these great drummers and bands have their signature drum keys. Um, like it's like just tons of punk bands and you know, it's, it's really cool. It's a, it's a fun thing. And uh, since I played with too many bands, I couldn't put a band logo on it. So I designed mine just to be like a universal drum key that has my signature on it. Nice. Yeah. It's cool. It's magnetic and stuff. Yeah. It's rad. I'm going to get one. Yeah. I highly recommend it. They're great. They're really cool. But um but yeah, this is the thing that I as far as drums that's, go, yeah, if we're not talking about like symbols and stuff like that, like as far as just drums. Like drums, this, yeah, like your main thing this, that you're like, this is this is kind of like your signature kind of like thing. You this know? is my this is my sound. I love this drum. I absolutely love it. And that I've done some modifications, like I said, to it that that make it sound different than than a different you know another one would yeah yeah yeah. the hoops the hoops are different and like mm -hmm. um they're different weights and so it's definitely got it's it, it's got a thing going that just feels like home to me when i hit it you know that's awesome yeah that's like yeah. those are like the best fucking it's the best gear yeah i love it i absolutely love this drum it's just not that fun to carry around <laughs> yeah. i'm like dude yeah. that is a carry-on forget it Ugh. do you have a wheel yeah. for that thing i know I actually talked to a company about building me a case with wheels because I just got sick of flying with it. And I don't want to like check it because like snare cases, like it's not like they lock, they, you know, yeah, mine yeah, don't yeah. like have latches or anything. I'm like, what if something happens to it? But then I stopped being such a weenie about it. And I was like, just checking it. Cause like, I couldn't do that. I couldn't put it overhead anymore. What if like that bin pops open? It falls in someone's and, like, head. <laughs> and it falls on someone's head, you know, like that's bad. Bad news. Yeah, that'd be bad. Then you hear like the snares rattling up there on the whole flight too. Oh yeah, not cool. It's annoying. Annoying. Oh man. So yeah, but well, I love that drum. Uh, well, Jared, thanks. Yeah, this was very fun and informative and hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. It's been like we'll have to do a part two at some point because I feel like there's a lot that we didn't get to. 
Uh, yeah, I'm if, really sorry. We, I, we we got off track a little bit. No, oh, no, no. It's great. Like, I, yeah. I love that we went on a adventure into jazz uh, and which is, which came is, back into I mean, punk. I mean, unfortunately, like, it's I can't deny that. You know, that's punk is a, is a huge part of my life. But jazz has, has I would I don't want to say it's bigger. I would say it's equally as big of in my life because it's I grew up on with both of them forming me at the same time. So I, th- I think all of that, just like being open to music in general and, and uh, all all types, like helps like be a better musician, be more creative, like get more inspiration other than listening to the same punk bands and just, you know, making version 2.0 over and over mm-hmm. again. Like, like if there wasn't all these other types of music out there, like I feel like punk would never grow. And like, you know, sure. I agree. Got totally it. agree. Yeah. So but, but is there I anything mean, you want to um, uh okay. anything else? No, it's just we didn't talk about like we only talked about drums, like 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 the drums. We didn't talk about symbols or anything. So I know. all of those questions you applied, like that all apply. There's also I can I can answer all those for each symbol or like for <laughs> uh each drum head, you know? So Got like it. each company, like yeah, like Sonar, I have my thing with Sonar. I have my thing with Peisty that I know which ones I'm going to go to or with Revo or, mm-hmm. or Vic Firth. Like, I know all, like, it's, it's, it's pretty challenging just to break something down, really. I, I didn't realize that it would be so hard to just talk about something so generalized, you know, because it's, well, there's so many moving parts. We didn't realize, well, thinking about it, I was like, oh, drums has way more stuff than just like guitars, you know? It's like, we can have an amp, guitar, and you got a pedal, right? Some of the, some people that we work with is like, oh, I, I, this is the pedal that I need no matter what. I can play it on any head, any guitar, but this pedal I need, you know? With drums, it's like, yeah. uh, there's a lot of moving pieces, you know, <laughs> obviously. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, but I also... I think... oh, go ahead. I was going to say that, that may not be true with everybody. You could maybe do this with Ben Kohler, and he would be like, I hit these things, and this uh, these are the ones that I like, and that's, that's it, true. you know? That's true, And yeah. you just got, you just asked the wrong person. <laughs> 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 well, is there anything you want to plug before we yeah anything new we, coming uh, up wrap up here tour. you guys got ways away's got a tour coming up don't you guys yeah yeah ways away um if you if you are able to or if you haven't heard my my newest band that we started a couple years ago called ways away it's with um uh jesse barnett from stick to your guns singing um sergi lupkoff from sam i am and ian smith from racket club in the band um and uh we have a full length out on other people records that's already out and then we have our second one we just finished and that's coming out um hopefully within by uh by, by summer I, I imagine i'm not sure but that record will be out soon um and i'm really proud of that one we we it's a really fun band if you're a fan of sam i am then you'll be a fan of ways away hopefully yeah, they're a really good uh, band. Um, I definitely we toured uh, together. People, yeah, I definitely advise only, people to check it out. Yeah, it's, it's, really good. it's fantastic. Right. I love Ways Away. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and other than that, it's just um, yeah. If you want to just see what I'm up to, because it's really hard to kind of break down what I'm going to do. I, yeah. I don't know until the last minute, you know. Yeah. But if you want to, you want to see like you know maybe a cool thing of me playing at Rock and Rio or or something like it. You know, those things happen. And it, you know, just check, gr- check it out. Check it out on the gram. You can look at me on Instagram. It's not very exciting. Just yeah. like me playing what I consider well, I don't cool know. drum beats. I, yeah. I heard rumors that there's a big announcement coming soon. So maybe people want to, maybe, maybe yeah. they want to check it out. Oh, and, yeah. and Jared's a cat guy too. So the three of us have that in common. There we go. Yeah. Oh, live. real quick. I think we, uh, I think we're, we, we have matching numbers, Fred. Oh, uh, how many do you have? <laughs> well, how many do you have? <laughs> I'm going to put a hand up. I can still do it on one hand, but just barely. Okay. okay. Yeah, dude. High five. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that rips. So um, that's right. Well, let's. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hell yeah. Let's, uh, we'll let's all hang soon. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, sure. sure.